Friends, on the journey to the intersection of balance and fun, there are two paths in which we could take. On the one hand, we could add a lot of go power, even more stopping power, and some computer wizardry in between. Or on the other hand, we could just take stuff out and let the car do less. Take a wild guess which path we're taking today. So Motorman wouldn't give us the car back. He's left me here to explain uh, the roller skate here to you. Uh, this is this is a naked MX-5 if you take away the body. Um, and uh, he wanted me to talk about the engine a little bit. Uh, this is a two liter Skyactiv engine, uh, same basic engine that you have in a Mazda 3 or a CX-3 or even the base CX-5. Um, we obviously made some changes to it to, to put it in the MX-5. Turning it north-south, we have to change the intake manifold and the exhaust manifold and the oil pan, engine mounts, that kind of thing. Uh, but internally it's the same, 13 to 1 compression, we've got a very uh, a unique sort of set of technologies to let 13 to 1 compression actually coexist with uh, with uh, street gas. Um, and we've got a unique piston that's uh, it's got a very steep dome piston to achieve that 13 to 1 compression, but we've carved a, a little semicircular uh, cavity out of the top of it that lets the flame kernel start up and uh, lets the, the combustion happen very quickly. The faster the combustion happens, the less likely it is to knock. Um, direct injection, variable valve timing, incredibly wide range of variable valve timing uh, on the intake cam so that we can actually run as a Miller cycle at light load. So we actually open the throttle completely at light load and control the engine power with cam timing. Um, I could go on forever uh, about the, the weird little details in this engine that make it so efficient. But really what makes it special uh, for the MX-5 is that we lightened the flywheel up a little bit. We uh, took about 20% of the inertia off the flywheel. And we also tuned it for much sharper throttle response by tuning it for premium fuel instead of regular like it is uh, in the rest of the cars. And premium fuel is a lot more knock resistance and in a quick transient, uh, when you snap the throttle open, that's when the engine is most likely to knock. And so you have to make the throttle uh, inputs a little bit uh, a little bit smoother uh, when you're tuning for regular gas. Uh, when we're tuning for premium, we can make it really sharp. So the throttle response is really strong on this. The mid-range torque is really strong, so it pulls out of a corner really well. I mentioned the manifolds and the oil pan to fit this uh, engine in the MX-5, but there's one very important change that we made uh, to make this car engine really appropriate for sports car duty, uh, and that's changing the valve cover. Uh, the re normally the valve cover is plastic. Uh, we figure when you open the hood on, on, on a sports car, you don't want to see a piece of Tupperware. Uh, so we actually made a new valve cover that's slightly heavier and slightly more expensive to make simply so it would look right when you open the hood of a sports car. Wait a minute. What's that number again? 155? 155? I don't care what language you say it in, that is nothing. Who the hell in their right mind brings out a sports car in 2015 with 155 horsepower. Friends, once I picked my chin up off the floor and actually got behind the wheel of this thing, I immediately got it. And like all joking aside, you and I have known since the beginning of time for Miatas in 1989, these have always been about power to weight. But this ND, this is like a, a whole different religion. Get this. The car I am sitting in, which is not like a special race prep car or anything like that, this is a car that will turn up in dealerships. This weighs 2,340 pounds. If you were to make the incredibly foolish decision in my book of getting an automatic, 2,380 pounds. Let's put this another way. That Porsche Boxster GTS that we drove on this very road and waxed on poetically about how that is the definition of balance, is 800 pounds more than this car. More than 30% of the weight of this. Further comparison, that Boxster was already 2,000 pounds less than an AMG Mercedes. The weight, almost the weight of this car. Now, if you really need more horsepower in your ND Miata, I am certain Brendan and the guys over at Flying Miata will be more than happy to sort you out. But for today, you and I need to unpack the why and the how of 155 horsepower working in a sports car in 2015. One of the little magic ingredients to make uh, a less powerful, lighter weight car feel so strong and so responsive uh, is this power plant frame here. This is this aluminum truss that connects the transmission and diff. 
This has been on every Miata since the first generation and every rear wheel drive car uh, that Mazda's made since we did since we came up with this on the first Miata. And what this is doing is this is allowing us to sharpen the throttle response in the car. Uh, when you are, are kind of getting off on and off the throttle, uh, those quick transitions are loading and unloading the engine mounts and the transmission mounts and the diff mounts. Uh, and the diff mounts the, the trickiest one because the diff is putting all this torque into the rear wheels and the reaction is lifting the nose of the diff here. And so if you just have a rubber mount there, it's it's having to hold the nose of that diff down. And you can make a really stiff mount uh, to hold that down, but then of course you have all these uh, gear noises transmitted into the car. So you have to make them soft and then you have this rubbery drivetrain. By connecting the, the transmission and diff with this rigid, pretty rigid frame, where then holding the nose of the diff down with the entire weight of the engine. Uh, so that's much, much easier uh, for us to hold, to hold things in place. We take all of those torque reactions and, and cancel them out. Uh, and now we have, we were able to tune a much sharper throttle response without having all that wind up. Uh, and direct response, both in the, the throttle and the steering is really what makes the car fun to drive and what gives you confidence when you're driving the car. The same thing's kind of going on in the, in the steering. We really work to make sure that the steering response is very linear. The car does exactly what you expect it to do. And this complicated multi-link rear suspension here uh, is, is part of that key. And we've got two different kinds of sort of passive steering that go on in this rear suspension. One is, is called compliance steer. We've got all these rubber bushings and they're all tuned differently. And the, the way they comply when you put a side load on the tire can cause it to, the tire to tow in or to tow out. Um, and then we also have a kinematic steer. So when the suspension goes up and down through its travel, uh, as the suspension compresses, does it steer it in or steer it out? What we've done with, with, the, with the previous car, we had two opposing steering forces going on. We would, we would have a, a, kin, a, a compliance tow out. So when you first put a side load on the, on the tire, it would tow out a little bit and kind of throw the car into the corner and then it would roll uh, and tow in and stabilize the car. Um, they made the car very nimble, but it was a little bit unsettling for some people. So what we did to make this more predictable, uh, the compliance uh, steer toes in a little bit, uh, and then as the body rolls, it toes in a little bit more. They're both very subtle, but it, it makes the car behave very linearly and gives you a lot of rear grip that you can really feel like you can count on, you can rely on as you go into that corner. And then, then we tune it so it has a really neutral balance through the middle of the corner. But having that really linear response as you turn the wheel really gives you a lot of confidence and makes, you, makes it possible to enjoy the car to its limit. Okay, so that's a dizzying array of moving parts to kind of keep straight, but how does it all translate to out here on the road? And rather than me tell you what you already know, let's unpack why this ND is more fun to drive and more balanced. And really there are three reasons. Uh, number one, the construction, the fenders, the bumpers, uh, the control arms, the bit that separates the passenger compartment and the trunk, even the leading edge of the roof construction, that's all more aluminum. And the second piece, if you guys are familiar with Miatas since the beginning of Miatas, they've always had these power plant frames, like Corvettes have a torque tube, kind of a similar concept, and the idea is, to, is really two things. Number one is to keep the car from twisting under load and to keep the car from like picking up when you really accelerate, more of a problem in cars like Corvettes, but you kind of get my drift. In this case, it is a, it is a more simple piece, uh, but it is more rigid. And then third, and this is really interesting, is the rear suspension. It is still a dynamic, fancy, multi-link unit, which we love, but instead of a tow-in and tow-out, which was more complex, this has tow-in under two circumstances. So the overall effect, putting all those bits together and then all the many other things we've kind of covered, is you get, so that Porsche GTS that we drove, remember that had no pitch, squat, dive, or roll, but that was a $100,000 car with many computer controls. This is a sub $30,000 car with limited computer controls. And really, this is you wanting to go around a corner, and it's, it's roll that you welcome because it's you planting the ass end of your car where you want it. Get it? So way back in the day of 1989 when Mazda introduced the Miata, it was a very different car company than it is today. Effectively, it was a group of engineers sitting around in a room that came up with a cool car. And there was a couple of car guys in there as well. Um, but take a look at, for example, the, uh, the door handles on an NA Miata, unlike any other Mazda of the time. Now fast forward to today and 
I don't want to say it's it's business, but it kind of is. It's a healthier car company because now they've got like a cohesive strategy of how do you interact with a car? Like, take a look at this unified controller down here. This comes straight out of the Mazda 3, like with that iPad thing up there as well. And you would think, oh, it's like part sharing, but the reality is uh, it's made this interior, believe it or not, more simple like the NA, unlike the NC. So in essence, it's kind of like going back to the future. Okay, so I will admit we are driving one of the most important new cars in recent years. And we are doing so in the top secret Moto Canyon. Let's just say this is an incredibly good day at the office, but we still have to talk about the interior. And this is where like Mazda has done this like dash theme before. We saw it on the Scion IA, and uh, you and I are gonna see it on the uh, CX3 soon. But the idea is to kind of slim out the interior. But there is a further trick here, which is very cool. This body color thing, so whatever you choose on the outside, so this is sole red in this case, they bring it into the interior. It even goes underneath the A pillar. And the effect is it lowers the height of the interior. It's not like, like a Fiat Jolly where you're hanging out of the car, but it's, it's like you feel more open and airy. And just like a word to the wise here, I'm six foot tall and I actually fit in this thing. Uh, there is a weird adjustment here, this the seat adjustment. It's not a height adjustment and it's not a thigh adjustment. It's like a combination of height and thigh. It's just adjusts the, the, the front height of the seat, but it's not the seat that's moving. It's, it's like the seat cushion is pivoting. It's very odd, but I digress. Anyway, uh, there's one key thing about this interior other than this, this body color trick. Notice where the cup holders are. There's one here and there's one like here. You got to be like a pterodactyl to be able to get to this one. and. <laughs> <laughs> this, I have to steal a line from Dave Coleman. Our, he calls himself the official Miata nerd. Uh, he was like, you know what? Shifting is more important than drinking. And now for the MG test. Step one, plant your ass in the driver's seat. Step two, release the top. Notice, before we go to the next step, the window goes down and that is not an electric top. Step three, bring the top up. Step four, lock the top into place. Now, before we get to step five, we actually have to put the window back up. And then step five, continue on your way. Okay, so we've been rambling on big time about this car, but let's set the table on some perspective here. This ND is both smaller and lighter and less horsepower than the NC it replaces. But now I want to give you a quiz. If I were to describe the following car, what is it? 1.6 liter engine, 116 horsepower, 100 pound-feet of torque, 2,116 pounds, and zero to 60 in a fire-breathing nine seconds. Is it A, the brand new Mitsubishi Mirage, B, a Soviet-era Trabant, or C, one of the most iconic sports cars the world has ever known? Now, the car we've been driving in this film thus far is not the biggest, baddest Miata out there. This is kind of the middle of the road model. This is the club sport but it is the one you and I want because it has upgrades, mechanical upgrades for car guys. Uh, number one, the suspension, it's got Bilstein dampers. Number two, it's got these strut tower braces here, so if you're gonna track the car. Then there's some aero mods, like you got the air dam in the front, the side skirts, a spoiler in the back, and some other bits there. Uh, then they try to dress it up for you. They've got these black mirror caps, but really, this car here, the one we're looking at, serial number ending 664, there is something fitted to this car and we're not gonna play the options game here because you can only get two options and it's got both. Uh, this one, the biggest option is the BBS wheels. It's a package with the Brembo front brake rotors. Oh, and by the way, only comes with a manual transmission. Uh, and then there is a Grand Touring. And they went out of their way to say it's not like a club sport is below the Grand Touring or the Grand Touring is like the top of the line. Like they're, they're trying to separate the two. 
Um, and I personally am a little confused because like this one, you get all the stuff we talked about, but the Grand Touring, that's the one with the real leather seats. Uh, that's the one that has like the lane departure, but it also has more color. Like you can get a tan leather interior, which when you see it in this car, especially with a soul red, Santa Maria, Madre de Dios, that is the only way to go. So if you've been watching thus far and really paying attention, forget about trying to suss out whether I like this thing or not. Really the question is for the folks at Mazda and their hope of getting this car back. To them I say, vaya con Dios. So in summary, what do we got? Well, with Mazda's move to the ND Miata, what they have effectively accomplished, friends, who the hell am I kidding? This is very good. It's actually much better than you think it is. And frankly, you need to drive it. End of story. So with that, let's move on to how to improve a car that frankly, I don't know how to improve. Remember that whole Grand Touring v Club Sport debate we kind of had? Um, I actually brought that to the high commissioners of Mazda. And I said, hey, what's going on here? And they flat out didn't say no to the concept of a Grand Touring Club Sport. They said, we're monitoring the situation. So you know what that means? I'm gonna turn this around to you guys. Do you guys wanna see a Grand Touring Club Sport? So like some fancy stuff in the Club Sport car, or at least the one I would want is the leather interior, the tan leather interior of the Grand Touring in the Club Sport like we've been driving here. So let us know in the comments below or via our social media, Moto Man TV, all one word, Moto Man TV, all one word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and we will take your feedback to the powers that be at Mazda, and hopefully we can have some sort of derivation of the bits of Grand Touring in the club sport, at least that color interior. And with that, we have one more piece of business to tend to, and that is in the preview film of this car, I left you guys with a trivia question, and that was, who is the average buyer of this car? Because there's a myth out there that this is a girl's car, uh, when in reality, the average buyer of this vehicle, and has been since day one, is predominantly males over 50 years old. <laughs>